one thing for us to think about is how could we adapt polar coordinates to use in three dimensions. So how could we generalize that to use in more dimensions? Of course, polar coordinates are good in two dimensions. If you have a location x and y, remember instead of thinking about them as a grid location, we thought, well, we'll just think about how far is this point from the origin, that's r, and then what's the angle that you make with the positive x-axis, that's theta. Now, just as a reminder, um, these coordinates should be pretty familiar with you. This, this idea should be pretty familiar to you that the x is equal to r cos and theta, and the y is equal to r sine theta. Now, this pair of equations is actually what we call um, a transformation. It takes two points, r and theta, and transforms them to two new points, um, x and y. Sort of visualize this as changing from the theta r plane to the x y plane. So if, for example, if you have something simple in r theta, like um, r equals 1, that's just a horizontal line in um, the theta r plane. But those equations, that x equals r cosine theta and y equals r sine theta, transform that line into a circle of radius 1 here in the xy plane. So we have this transformation that the polar coordinate transformation turns lines of constant r into circles. It also turns lines of constant theta. So if theta is fixed, then what you get is you're always facing the same direction no matter what r is. So you get a line through the origin. So polar coordinates are a transformation that take um, lines of constant r and bends them into circles. It takes lines of constant theta and makes them into lines through the origin at that particular angle theta. Thinking about generalizing them, one thing might be if you have a point, say this point here in the um, xyz space, so it has location xyz, one thought might be to just, this point's at this level z here, what we could do is just drop a shadow here down into the xy plane. And then we could write that location in terms of r and theta. So r would be the distance of the shadow from the origin in the xy plane. And theta would be the angle that, uh, that we make with the positive x-axis. So in other words, your x location is going to be given by r cosine theta. Your y location is going to be r sine theta. And your z location is just the z location. Now we have a transformation. It has three inputs, r theta and z, and three outputs, x, y, and z. So it takes a pair, an r theta and z, and these transformations turn that pair into an x, y, and z. So it does a little bit of operation on r and theta to create x, but z is just natural. Now, we call this, this transformation cylindrical for a good reason, because if we fix r, so let's imagine that we fix r and theta and z are still free, then over here in r theta z space, we just have a plane of constant r. So I've drawn just a portion of that plane. But what's created over here in x, y, and z space is if r is fixed, then you have, for every value of z, you have a circle of radius r. And since there's no, there's no constraint on theta, you, could, you can go all the way around as many times as you like, or you could go backwards. Um, there's no constraint on z either, so the only constraint is that r has to be constant, and so this creates a nice circular cylinder. I know my picture isn't very nice, but you can imagine that a, a plane of constant r, this is a very simple object over in r theta z space, becomes a more complicated object. It's bent around to become um, a right circular cylinder. The cylinder, of course, extends infinitely unless you put some bounds on z. Um, we might also ask, well, what does the plane of constant theta do? Anyway, the fact that planes of constant r create cylinders is why this is called cylindrical coordinates. It tends to be very good for any time you have a shape that has 
um, symmetry around the origin cylindrical coordinates can be a good way to represent that shape. A uh, plane of constant theta, of course, um, just makes a plane through the, that contains the z-axis. So if you fix theta and you fix r, you can walk as far as you like, but that's going to create a plane through the z-axis. Of course, a plane of constant z, since z doesn't really change in this transformation, just becomes a plane of constant z over an xyz space as well. Now the main thing is that planes of constant r become cylinders. Now um, another way of generalizing this is a little bit different. Um, this idea is to create what's called spherical coordinates. So again let's imagine that we have some point here in space. It's got an x-coordinate and a y-coordinate and a z-coordinate. We're going to draw a line straight to the origin from this point, and we'll call that distance rho. And then we will measure the angle that this line makes with the positive z-axis, and we'll call that angle phi. So when I write a rho, I start here, I go around the back and make a little curly. When I write a phi, I make a curly, but I cut down through the middle. So you can see they end up looking a little bit different. Actually, I don't usually put that long of a tail on a phi. So there's my symbol phi versus my symbol rho coming across the back without going down through the center. So this is the equivalent of a Greek letter R, of course, for radial distance, right? And um, phi is uh, kind of a pH sound or an F sound. Okay, let's see. Then what we can do is we can say, well, let's, let's look at the shadow that this point casts down here in the xy plane. Okay. And then we could measure this distance r, and again measure this angle theta. But r is actually related to um, phi, because if we look at this sidelong, so I'm drawing a line straight over from the z-axis out to this point. It's just your perspective that makes, might make you think that looks angled, but this is actually a, a right angle right there. If I copy this triangle over, you'll see here's the positive z-axis and here's the line that has length rho going out to our point. And here's our angle phi. Right? We could call it the tip-out angle, how much we tip out from the positive z direction. We have this angle phi. Then you know that this distance is rho sine phi and then this distance would be rho cos phi, just from our usual trigonometry. So actually here, this distance r is the same as the distance over there, which is rho sine phi. From here, we can get the equations, because x is going to be r cosine theta, again, just like from usual polar, but this distance r can be obtained from rho and phi, r is rho sine phi. So x is rho sine phi cosine theta. y is r sine theta, but then r is again rho sine phi because that's this length here. When you look at the shadow of that point in the xy plane, that's our r, but it's rho sine phi from considering this triangle. And then we get sine theta. And of course, this is the z-coordinate here. It's rho cos phi. So z is rho cos phi. OK, so you need to understand where these equations are coming from. These, again, make a transformation. Transformation from one three-dimensional space, where the names of the variables are r, phi, and theta, to another three-dimensional space, where the names of the variables are x, y, and z. Let's look at some of the implications of this transformation. So x is rho sine phi cosine theta. y is rho sine phi sine theta. And z is rho cos phi. Make sure you can draw the picture and obtain these, these equations that transform us. Now, what happens when we fix rho over here in rho phi theta, then we just get 
this vertical plane, right, where all the where the row the value of rho is always the same and the value of phi and theta can be the same. That means that you can tip out as far as you want and you can go around the z-axis as much as you want. You can make any angle with the positive x-axis in the xy plane, but you can you always have to go the same distance out from the origin. You always have to go the same distance out from the origin. That's going to create a sphere. So we're going to see this this infinite plane here gets wrapped around to become to become a sphere here. So we get mm, that's not a very good sphere. I'm trying to make like three circles intersecting here so you could see the sphere. So that's why we call them spherical coordinates because if you fix rho, you naturally get a sphere. Rho measures the radial distance, so this makes a nice way to represent a sphere very quickly. Um, we can, might also ask, what happens if you fix um, phi? Well, if you fix phi, so then you have a plane of constant phi here. Maybe I should draw it that way. There we go. We have this plane of constant phi. Um, that means you have to tip out the same amount, but you can look from the z-axis in any direction you want, and you can go out as far as you want. This actually creates a cone then. You always have to tip out the same amount, but theta can change, so you can go all the way around, and rho can change, you can go out as far as you like. So if you fix phi, you get a cone. Fixing rho here gives a sphere. Fixing phi gives a cone. And if you fix theta, then that fixes the angle that you make with the xy axis. But there's no restriction on how far out you can go or how much you have to tip out, and so this is going to give this plane of constant theta over in rho phi theta space is going to give us a plane through the origin, or plane through the z plane containing the z axis. Containing the z axis. So just want to start you thinking about these coordinate systems, these generalizations of polar. You can see where they come from. I want you to be able to derive these equations and start thinking about them because they'll be very important to us later on. So there's this, there's the spherical ones. Here are the cylindrical ones. R cos theta, R sine theta, Z equals Z, and then R familiar polar ones, x equals r cos and theta, y equals r sine theta. So there's polar and cylindrical. And up here we have spherical. Just like that.